Good afternoon. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Later on, in the Revelation to John, our Lord Jesus said these words, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you will live also. For all who have gathered here this afternoon, family, and friends of either Joan or Joe or the children. We have gathered here for many reasons. We have gathered to praise God. We have gathered to witness to our faith as we celebrate Joan's life. But it is true. We come together in grief because we acknowledge that there is a human loss. For all who have gathered, may God now search our hearts that in the midst of pain, we find comfort. In the midst of our sorrow, we find hope. And even in the midst of death, we get a glimpse of resurrection. It is in dying Christ destroyed our death, and it is in rising that Christ restored our life. And we who believe claim that Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, decades ago, Joan put on Christ, so now in Christ may she be clothed with glory. For us who are gathered here, we are reminded that we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we do know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. I would invite those who are able to stand, please stand as we join in singing for all the saints. It is in our hymnal. It is number 711, 711.
You may be seated. Let us pray. Eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us whom we name in our hearts before you. We praise you for your child, Joan, whom you have taken to yourself. Grant peace to all of their souls and let perpetual light shine upon them. And help us so to believe where we have not yet seen that your presence may lead us through our years and bring us at last with them into the joy of your home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. This prayer I lift through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. And seeing the multitudes, he went up onto a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The word of the Lord. Thank you, thank you, Susan, for reading those words from our Lord's Sermon on the Mount. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations and the ponderings of each and every heart be acceptable unto you, and not only in this place or for this time, but always. It is through Christ who truly is our rock, and our Redeemer, that I lift this prayer. Amen. It has been through recent months that I have had the privilege, the honor, and the opportunity to get to know Joan, and to get to know Joe a little bit, and their family. Now, through the months, as I've had conversations with Joan, I have gotten to realize, and we would laugh together about this, that we shared many similar threads. And even as I was reading through the newspaper article, I found myself smiling as um, I read some of the adjectives used to describe Joan. And even though I've only known her a few months, I had to recognize that they were good, accurate adjectives, strong, strong-willed, standing firm. It was when I thought of Joan and I thought of her years, her willingness to make a move with Joe to a new area, and not only making a move with family, and away from family and all that was familiar, I also realized that she had become a part of the community thread here in Chesterfield and in the Richmond community. 
As I was thinking about those words in our conversations, especially um, conversations of her past and her expectations for the future, there were two passages of scripture that came to my mind. One from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It is Paul writing, and he's writing to a newly formed group of people claiming themselves as Christians. And guess what? In that community, there was some disagreements and dissensions. Can you believe that? That there'd be any community where there would be differences of opinions. Well, he writes, and I share these words beginning with verse 4 of chapter 12. There are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of working, but it is the same God who inspires them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom. I had the privilege of hearing some of those words of wisdom from Joan. And to another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are inspired by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Again, it was when I was reflecting on her work here in the community. Even this today, when I listened, spoke to a few people, they would share insights about a vision, a determination to make this community better than what it had been. But that also brings the next passage that came to my heart or to my mind. It is from 1 Peter chapter 3. For me, it has been a passage that has given me both hope and affirmation. And for those who have gathered here with your history of knowing Joan much, much better than I have, cried with her, maybe laughed with her, worked beside her, or you, had the, you have had the opportunity to work with her children, to get to know the children who have come from Joan. May these words also bring you comfort and affirmation. From 1 Peter 3, beginning with verse 13. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is right? I've known Joan a little bit, and I would say zealous is a good word. What do you think? that when she had something set in her heart, and her mind, she was zealous about making sure that it would get done. Even if you do suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, reverence Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. And keep your conscience clear so that when you're abused, those who revile you cannot revile your good behavior in Christ, but they may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing right, if that should be God's will, than for doing wrong. Just a couple passages of scripture that made me reflect on the little bit of time that I have known Joan and gone to know Joe and her family. But I also want to close with this passage. Susan, you made reference to it when Jesus was talking on that Sermon on the Mount about blessed are those who are, will, who are mourning, for they will be comforted. 
I thought about that, just that verse. And it reminded me of these strong final teachings of Jesus in John chapter 14. Because Jesus is telling these, his closest disciples, those people who had shared the years of walking through the Holy Land. He, he looks at them and he knows what's going to be happening within the next hours and in the next days. And I think that's where I connect the beatitude, blessed are those who are mourned, for they will be comforted with what Jesus is trying to tell those who are being prepared. In John chapter 14, verse 18, Jesus says, I will not leave you desolate. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. May these words of Jesus bring comfort and hope for the days and the weeks to follow. Amen. At this time, one of Joan's dear friends, Nancy, is going to come and share a few words and reflection. Nancy? Joan would be so happy to see so many of you and would love to um, have a, a visit with you. What she's been missing is she's been so sick, uh, particularly for the last couple of months. Uh, can you all hear me? I'm kind of laughing about that because neither Joan nor I can hear very well. And whatever meetings we went to, we sat on the front row. And I guess at the business council breakfast, they always wondered why she and I raced to get the table up closest to the speaker. Well, it was because we couldn't hear. But it also meant that people had a good opportunity to um, cluster around Joan, which they always did. And she always had a little circle around her at these monthly breakfasts that were so informative, and we appreciated so much that the uh, Chesterfield Business Council did. No doubt everyone in this room has a Joan Jerome story, probably lots of Joan Jerome stories. My most recent one describes Joan pretty well. For background, Joan and I met through Chesterfield County Council of PTAs in the 70s. We worked together through PTA for many years. And later, Joan and I worked together on many other projects, but primarily through the Chesterfield Business Council, Transportation Committee, Speed Rail, um, hundreds of meetings, more recently largely about transportation. Uh, and I hope you see in the reception the map of Joan's, she called it My Little Railroad. And some of you all have heard Joan talk about My Little Railroad. And it's her belief that the tracks exist for rail that could become commuter rail from Amelia into Chesterfield all the way to the airport. She talked about it for years. She carried that map around with her. She was very disappointed, I believe, I could ask Joan Holland, that the Board of Supervisors never passed that resolution. So. Big black mark if you, <laughs> if you didn't do that. Um, on March 8th, I called Joan to whine. I did that a lot. Um, it wasn't an unusual call for me. We are in the middle of downsizing, 
And all of those agendas, minutes of meetings, and reports with Joan that I had saved were overwhelming me. I described my frustration to her. There was a pause, and she said, it's over, Nancy. Do you think your kids or my kids are going to read any of that stuff? Throw it away. Well, it's over, Nancy. How prophetic and how true. In just five weeks, it was over for Joan. But oh, how her words had helped me. I've tossed a lot. I've been better about it since she told me I needed to trash all that stuff. But while we were talking, she said, I don't feel very well. Could I call you back later? That was unheard of from Joan to complain or say she didn't feel well. It was so odd that I called Susan, her daughter, and left a message that I was worried about Joan. Susan called not long after to say Joan was on her way to the hospital and had said she thought she was having a heart attack. The ambulance driver then headed toward Chippenham. No, directed Joan. <laughs> that no driver was not gonna argue with this woman even if she was having a heart attack. Turned out Joan's choice was the right one. She was having a gallstone attack and one that finally produced complications she couldn't overcome. The driver wasn't the first one to learn Joan Jerome was one determined woman. Woman, and I know her family all knows that, and certainly Joe did. Um, she wasn't one to waste time. That's how these anecdotes about Joan help explain her as the person I knew. Get on with life. Nancy, accept your lot. We're old. Throw that stuff away. And like the driver, many have learned that when Joan wanted to make something happen, she was dogged. She didn't give up, especially when she decided to run for the Board of Supervisors, when no one thought a woman could win. Yet she did win for three terms. For Joan, it was never about being a woman or running for women. Joan ran because she thought the schools could be better. That was her first concern as a result of her work in the schools and PTAs. We needed better roads. That's still the case, I would say. Public transportation and especially business needed to play a role in the advancement of Chesterfield County. She was always involved in the business community and plugging them in where they needed to be to make things happen. Her firsts are many. Her community constituent meetings, for the first time, nobody had been doing that before to my knowledge, allowed citizens to learn their county, what was going on from staff members, whether it was about the budget, public safety, or schools. And they weren't always pleasant meetings, but Joan could handle them marvelously. And some of you all have been to those meetings that there are always some gripers there. And Joan could stay pleasant, never get aggravated and handle them, but be very firm in what she was saying and what was happening. At some point in her 12 years on the board, Joan had heard enough from voters. She made a sign that was a fixture at her meetings. It read, how much government do you want and how much are you willing to pay for? Susan brought that sign today. It's in the reception lobby there. And that should be mounted somewhere. I see some supervisors here. Um, maybe down at the courthouse in memory of Joan and <laughs> to remind all voters that, yeah, you want everything, but are you willing to pay for it? That sign said it all to those who came to plea for services. She may not have been opposed to what they were saying, but the sign was simply a reminder. What you want, what you get, you have to pay for. 
a truism of government. As the first and only woman on the board, Joan was never allowed to serve as chairman, but she paved the way. Women serve as chair now regularly. While Joan has been out of office for 31 years, she didn't, like so many elected leaders do, end her interest and activity. Route 288 is a project she helped shepherd in the 90s. She was co-chair of the 288 committee that made that road happen. And when you ride on it, you might have a moment of appreciation for the work that Joan put into that 288 that has made such an enormous difference in our area. In fact, in 2011, in my pile of agendas and meeting notes, Joan writes that Chesterfield needs the vote to be equalized on the Richmond Metropolitan Authority. Now, I don't know how many people at Joan's age would be worrying about how many votes there should be for Chesterfield on the authority. As far as the Chesterfield Business Council goes, she wrote, we need to push the Greater Richmond Chamber to reestablish a regional transportation committee. There are also some chamber people here, so you all remember what Joan <laughs> advised. We would never have built Route 288 without that committee, she wrote. That was eight years ago, and Joan was 83, still involved. Joan didn't like to attend a meeting with no agenda, no reason for the meeting. She did our agendas for our business council, Dan Gecker, monthly meetings. They were substantive, water needs, proffers, the county's comprehensive plan. We weren't there to chit-chat. We did a little bit of that too. But <laughs> no one ever loved newspapers more than Joan. Dick, her son, visited Joan Sunday morning and delivered the Times Dispatch. She was reading it when he left. In about 25 minutes, she was gone. I couldn't help but quip. Wonder what the Times Dispatch did this time. <laughs> she, <laughs> she didn't hesitate to respond when she felt the Times Dispatch had made a big mistake editorially. She wrote letters, she called the editors, and she would make clear that she thought they had, could do better than they had. Her love of newspapers led her to keep everyone else as informed as she. Visit her and you would find her tucked in the middle of stacks of the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and Times Dispatch. She would be clipping articles from all those newspapers for people she knew would be interested, and for people like me who loved keeping up but didn't have time to read three newspapers every day. I don't know how many people she clipped for, but my clips came regularly in the mail. In my last visits with her, I, as usual, started to chat about the latest political news. She didn't want to talk about politics, she wanted to talk about basketball. VCU's basketball game was the next night, and she showed me her new VCU t-shirt that Sam Seeley, who is here, had taken to her. She was in intensive care then, but still waiting for that basketball game. On my last visit with her, April 8th, Nothing was on her mind but the Virginia game that night. She was so excited about the University of Virginia and about their being in the Final Four and being in the championship game. Are you going to watch, she asked. And then she worried that she wouldn't be able to stay awake, but she was bound to determine to see that game. She and Joe shared a love of sports. She watched his beloved Yankees with him. No wife has ever been more devoted than she to her husband. For more than two years, she visited Joe in the Laurels nursing home every day. She arranged transportation for herself and her wheelchair. It was all about wheelchair, so she could stay with him. That was no easy visit for her. 
A year ago, she and I were talking about places for seniors to walk. She said she and Kyle Wolfham, board chair of the Midlothian YMCA, wanted the upper level of the new gym to be built so it could accommodate an upper level track. That would be a perfect way for the Y's large senior constituency to have a place to walk so they wouldn't have to go to the mall, she thought. She and Kyle couldn't get support from the rest of the board members. They said it was too expensive. When she told me this story, she said, I didn't think that would cost a lot. She continued, I think when I die, I'll just say memorial contributions can go to that walk. Only Joan would attempt to help Chesterfield citizens after she was gone. A great lady can tell loved by many of us. You know, I've never spoken in a church before. This is, this is pretty cool. My name is Bill Jerome, and in the words of the late, great Louis Grizzard, I am my mama's baby boy, and that is a role that I cherish. On behalf of Susan and Dick, thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate that. Uh, my mom and dad were active in the Sunday school here at Bonaire Methodist until traveling back and forth on Sundays became uh, a little bit more than they could handle. And if there are any members of those classes here today, I want you all to know how much my parents looked forward to Sundays and the lively discussions that ensued and more importantly, all the friendships that came out of that. To the staff at the crossings and at the Laurels uh, Willow Creek, thank you. Uh, knowing both that Joe and Joan were cared for and cared about was a tremendous source of comfort to Susan and Dick and I uh, during a difficult time. Kathleen, many thanks to you and the staff here at the church for all your help and your support in a difficult time. Nancy, you know, although I only met you in December, I felt like I've known you much longer because um, I, in conversations with my mom, especially in the last 10 years, there was always some reference to you when she and I were talking. She admired and respected you, and I know that your friendship was something that was incredibly dear to her because she told me. So thank you for your kind words. My mother led a public life, so who she was and what she accomplished are, are not mysteries. Allow me to share a little history with you that may give you some insight into why she was the way that you knew her. When she was elected to the board in 1975, I can remember kids coming up to me and probably to Dick too at school and saying things like, is your mom gonna run for president? Well, she couldn't run for president because she was born in Canada, Kingston, Ontario to be specific. And later she obviously became a naturalized citizen. Helen and Art Cruz were Joan's parents. Helen was a registered nurse and a teacher. She was warm and wonderful, dignified, intelligent, and determined. She was a grandmother in the Norman Rockwell sense. It's been said that true strength is not rigidity, but flexibility. Helen always stayed true to her principles and was a pillar of strength, I think, in the very best sense of that word. As many of you here today know, my mother loved to send newspaper clippings. She got that from her mother, and I didn't re realize until yesterday that she actually, as a child, worked for a newspaper clipping service. So she came by all of this honestly. Art Cruz. All right, let me tell you about Art Cruz. Six foot three, sinewy strong, a crushing handshake, 
that would bring Dick and I to our knees whenever we would visit him in his home. He was a hockey player in an era with no masks and no helmets. Did I mention he was the goalie? And he had the broken noses and the missing teeth to prove it. We have a picture of him perched on a camel in the Egyptian desert when he served in the Royal Canadian Army during the First World War. He had a 1950 Mercury Cruiser with suicide doors that was just about the coolest thing that Dick and I had ever seen. He drank Canadian whiskey straight and he wore a beret. Cigarettes cost him a lung in 1959. He was a man's man and he did not suffer fools lightly and needless to say he was tough. When my mother graduated from high school in 1945, she was accepted at William and Mary and had even been assigned a roommate. She brought the acceptance letter to her dad, who read it, and then promptly explained to her that she wasn't going to William and Mary. And the reason she wasn't going to William and Mary, because there were no reason for women to have a college education. It was always interesting to me to note that whenever my mom would tell me that story, there was never a note of emotion in her explanation. If she resented her dad for what he had done, she never expressed it. And please don't judge my grandfather too harshly. He was a product of a different era, obviously. He was a very good man, and he loved his family. And as we all know, things worked out pretty well for my mom. From there, it was to Fifth Avenue in the Garment District in Manhattan. She was a buyer for a defunct department store called Franklin Simon from 1946 to 1954. She drove a cream-colored MGTD sports car with a red leather interior. Okay, Joan had style. Let's get that straight. Um, why did they ever sell that car? Her best friend was Rita Jerome, and Rita had a brother in the Army whose name was Joe. When Joe was discharged, he also worked in Manhattan, and Rita introduced Joe to Joan one afternoon as they were headed home in, under the Hudson River in the Hudson Tubes. A few days later, my dad called my mom and he asked her out. And my mom said she couldn't go. Uh, she said she had other plans when, in fact, she was expecting a call from another guy that she was interested in. So she turned my father down. She hung up the phone and it dawned on her that this other person hadn't actually called her yet. And she didn't really have a date. And so she picked up the phone and she called my father back and she accepted his invitation. And they were married a little over three, uh, they were married about a year later. And when their third child was born, they decided that New Jersey was not the place that they wanted to raise their children. So in 1960, my dad accepted a position with Smithern Corporation and moved us to Richmond. He bought a house that my mom had never seen. She told us that she had told him that her only requirement for the new house was that it have a dishwasher. What he didn't tell her was that the house was painted pink. By the next year after we had moved in, it was a dignified shade of green, and four years later they built the house here in Bonaire. The design, construction, and decoration of, the home, of that home had considerably more of my mother's input. A quick story from the days in the pink house. As you all know, Joan was tall. We used to measure her, and uh, it seemed important to us at the time. And she, she topped out, uh, we always wanted her to be six feet tall, but she topped out at 5'11 and 3 quarters. So one day, Dick brought several kids from the neighborhood by and brought them into the kitchen where Joan was preparing dinner and towering over the awestruck group of five-year-olds. And Dick blurted out, see, I told you she was a big one. <laughs> uh, my mother loved Bon Air. Um, I don't know what's up with this whole North Chesterfield thing, but uh, she loved Bon Air. And she told me many times that it was the place that she felt she belonged. And, and what a tremendous feeling to have to be in that place where you feel like you belong somewhere. It was her home. 
Uh, there, are two, there are two things you probably don't know about her political career, although there are some people in this audience who, who do know uh, these two stories. And I want to share them with you because she was far too humble to talk about herself that way. When she was running for the third district Republican congressional nomination, the Republican Party sent a consultant named Bob Weed up from Georgia to help her. And Bob had been uh, instrumental in helping Newt Gingrich get elected to Congress. Bob paid my mom what I believe she would have said was the highest professional compliment she could receive. Joan, he said, you are the only politician that I have ever met who was more interested in serving than being elected. During that same campaign, several influential businessmen whose names you would recognize asked to meet with her. She had them to our home for coffee one morning. They proposed a deal where she would abandon the congressional nomination bid in exchange for their support for pursuit of the office of her choice in the future. Now, my mom was not naive, and she understood how the game was played, and, the, and she also understood the power of an endorsement like this and what it could mean to her political career. Would her career have been different if she had chosen expediency over principle? It probably would have been. But Bob Weed was right, and Helen and Art's daughter wasn't raised that way. And she told them no. The transition to commercial real estate was a natural for her. No one knew more about the explosive growth here in Chesterfield than Joan. Many new relationships, both business and personal, developed in this stage of her life. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention a special one with Pat Clark, who was the manager with Long and Foster. I'm sure many of you know Pat. Pat could not be here today, but since Sunday, she and I have exchanged several text emails and phone calls. And Pat meant a lot to both of my parents, and she felt the same about them. There were a few things Susan asked me to include in my comments today that I think you would enjoy. Uh, as public as my mother's life was, she was a private person. To that end, we had a few nicknames for her. And they had, those nicknames had stayed within the confines of the family. To us, she was Big Joan. Big Joan was usually used in an exchange like this that might have occurred with Dick and I. And let's, we're in high school, and I got my chest puffed out, and I turned to Dick and I say, I'm going to Beach Week as soon as school is out. And Dick would turn and look at me and go, that's not what Big Joan said. <laughs> got the picture? Okay. After Helen passed away in 1985, Joan became the matriarch. And this title was bestowed through a combination of her lifelong affection for British royalty and her status as the oldest child. The matriarch wielded her power sparingly and lovingly. Her great-grandchildren on Susan and Harrison's side, I've learned, call her Great Joan, which I think is awesome. <laughs> Susan wanted you to know, too, that uh, and what follows are her words, not mine. Although our mother was a significant person in deed and in stature, she didn't cast a shadow. Instead, she shone light. It was a nurturing light, it was an affirming light, and it was a guiding light. She was my first and greatest blessing. That's, that's perfect. In closing, there is a Jackson Brown song that I love that some of you may know. It's called For a Dancer. It's about a friend of his who was a professional dancer and tragically died in a fire. The last stanza of the song goes, into a dancer you have grown from a seed somebody else has thrown. Go on ahead and throw some seeds of your own. And somewhere between the time you arrive and the time you go, may lie a reason you are alive, but you'll never know. For me, those lyrics capture both the promise and the mystery of this thing that we call life. And I don't think you get one without the other. My mother's life was a shining example of that, and I know that with absolute certainty for two reasons. The first, your presence here today. And the second is that on February 22nd, Michael Joseph Finelli was born to Brigitte and Michael. And he is his mama's baby boy. The cycle of life continues. Thank you all for being here today.
Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Bill. And for including words from both your sister and also from your little brother. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are God, creator of the universe, and your love never ends. When everything else fails, you still are God. And on this day, we pray to you for one another in our need. To those who have doubts, please give light. To those who are weak, we ask for your strength. To all who have sinned, we plead for your mercy. And to all who have sorrow and sadness, we ask for your peace. Keep true in us the love with which we hold each other, that in all our ways we may trust you. And on this day, we remember that you are also a God of love. We do thank you for happiness, for happiness with which you have blessed us even on this day. We thank you for the gift of life, for home, for family and friends, for health and strength, for work and nature and beauty. We thank you for our baptism and our place in your church. And more than all else, we thank you for Jesus, our Lord, who knew our griefs, who died our death and rose for our sake and, as he promised, lives and prays for us. Through Christ I pray, amen. I would invite you to join with me now in the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. We call it the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father. The words are in the hymnal number 895 in the back of the hymnal. Please join. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For those who are able, I would invite you to please stand for our closing song to sing, Onward Christian Soldiers. It is in our hymnal number 575.
Please remain standing. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. And where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. And where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to console as to be, cons to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. <clears throat> and now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, and present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and always. Amen. If you would remain standing while our organist plays Amazing Grace, Reverend Higgins and I will lead the family out to the commons where then you are invited to come and greet and share with the family. Okay. 